fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. All right, welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Uh, Co-hosting today is John Copenhaver. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Al? I'm delicious. Copenhagen. <laughs> I tell you, I guess I was thinking of, of the cigar earlier when I was saying oh. <laughs> I don't know what It's I was okay. Thinking. You know, it happens all the time. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Well, it's better than the things they call me. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, and now, let's see. What have we got going on here? Today, we are going to be talking uh, to the author of Fire on the Island, a romantic thriller. And it's Timothy J. Smith. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me on the program. Ah, it's our pleasure. Um, wow. So let's let's find out a little bit about you. So, uh, Tim, where did you um, start writing? Like, what, what was it for you that got you down this road of putting out a book? Well, I've always enjoyed writing. Uh, I, I, I've enjoyed any writing aspect of anything that I've done. Uh, I will say that I wrote my first stage play in fourth grade, so I was about 10 years old, and I started a novel when I was 12, but I went on to a different career and a different whole part of my life that was really exceptional. Uh, I was working around the world on programs to basically initially aid the, the very poorest of the poor and in the U.S. and then eventually internationally, but I developed some skill sets in finance and economic development that moved me into different kind of positions, and ultimately I ended up uh, being the manager, uh, the director and manager of the U.S. government's first significant program to aid Palestinians at the start of the peace process, and I lived in Jerusalem for three years, and I saw all sides of that story, and I felt at, when, that, when that contract was over that I, I had a story I really wanted to write. And I've always thought about writing full time. I just quit working and wrote that book and have ne- I've never looked back. Wow. So, so the, the things you've been on, the journeys, have really influenced your writing. A- absolutely. I, 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 I can't write about a place that I haven't really been. Uh, I did create a fictional country and a fictional town for my African novel, which is called Cooper's Promise. Um, but I really used the set and the settings to, to actually help help with the um, with with the story. I mean, it really put you know I, I want people to have a lot of authenticity, so I can't write about something I've never someplace I haven't really been to. I, I I will say right now I'm working on a novel that I've never lived in Istanbul, which is where it's set, mm-hmm. but I've been there many times over the last 30 or 40 years. So I feel I can, I can do that. But normally I, I write about places that I, I really spend a lot of time. Hmm. It's interesting. So, so how, how do you choose what you're going to write about? Uh, it seems like you, you, you've been around the world a lot and you've done a lot of uh, work in different countries and lived in places. Um, but how is it that you decide to put together a, a, a thriller or a book? Well, I start out in kind of a different place on, than, than a lot of writers, I think, in this regard, that I'm very much of a humanitarian and a political animal. And I look to issues that I have learned about for, in different ways, like human trafficking or different things I've been exposed to in this really incredible career I had for about 20, 25 years. Um, issues that people don't know, mu- don't know much about, so that are 
have social significance. So I first come up with the issue. What, what am I interested in telling about? Do I want to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian crisis or conflict? What kind of characters do I need? Or um, my book, The Fourth Courier, takes place right at the end of the collapse of, at the, really at the time of the collapse of communism in Poland. And what did that mean to ordinary Polish families? And I lived there for a couple of years, and so I saw what they were going through at that time. So I really start from the perspective of what do I think is an interesting event or upheaval or something that's pretty momentous in people's lives. And I then try to think of a of a suspenseful sort of story that would allow me to make it a thriller or a mystery um, and who my characters are going to be and how they're being affected by this event that I've chosen to try to eliminate. So I kind of come from the stories that way. I mean, in, all, in every case, really. What, what, what do I think people need to know about a little bit, but don't want to really read today's headlines at the same time? I'll tell you that I, I about 15, 16 years ago, I established something called the Smith Prize for Political Theater. And the guidelines for that to the playwrights who apply for it are basically take what's a, what's a big issue, what's a global issue, what's a, just what's a big issue, but how does it affect people intimately in their lives? And that's what the playwrights have done. And um, so I take that sort of guidance to my own work uh, because I'm just working in a different field of writing, different medium. So, so you, you actually have an underlying story. So when someone reads your book, there's the, there's the surface events but there is some sort of theme under it that you want people to take home with. Or just an understanding of the situation. So the Greek, my Greek book, which is my newest mm -hmm. book, which is Fire on the Island. Uh, it's set against the background of the, the two crises that really have faced village Greeks for the last few years, which is the refugee crisis and the economic crisis, and they're intertwined because, of course, the economic crisis actually started as a, as, a, as a debt crisis, but then the refugees came along and it became a second wave of a crisis, which is the tourism crisis. So I wanted, it just, and I'm very close to that situation. I know Greece very, very well. I've lived, I've spent about seven years of my life in Greece, and so I, I've never written anything about Greece before, and so this is my homage to Greece. And talking really about how people are being affected by these these things that, that that are out of their control and what it really has done to this one particular village in terms of the conflicts within that village. So it's uh, it's taking the the bigger issues down to the village level. Do you ever worry about backlash to your stories? Like you're you're touching off on some sensitive areas and and being the world so. Um, politicized lately there's so uh, there's a lot of talk out there and does that worry you or do you get some sort of a you know some sort of a backlash i don't get a backlash but it, it it does worry me and it's because i have taken on some issues from different perspectives and i'll say that when i the first novel i wrote which is called a vision of angels which is the israeli-palestinian conflict told from four different perspectives. Um, I did worry uh, about it because I, it was a time where um, it was really the beginning of the peace process or just into it. The publishing world was a little strange back then. There was a lot of uh, companies buying each other. Uh, here I had a book that was not, was not affirmatively pro-Israeli. It was it told the Israeli side of the story as well as it told every every side of the story. Um, in fact, I considered my when I was growing, I'll say this is this is sort of funny but or odd, but I'm not Jewish, but I considered myself a Zionist when I was growing up. I grew up in a community with a large Jewish population and you know I was going to be on a kibbutz and I was going to be doing all all that kind of stuff. And I ended up writing my first novel about a Palestinian Israeli conflict that was sort of balanced and but I felt a little bit like that might be threatening at, at that time. It, it's not threatening now. It's, you know, the world has moved so beyond what I've written. But, um, yeah, I, I, I would say that 
that was one situation where I just was unsure about whether I might be at risk. And I made sure I didn't have my address or my name or the town where I lived out on anything, basically. I'm really curious about sort of maybe it's a, a craft question, really. But, you know, when you're dealing with, you know, fairly socially, culturally, politically charged topics, how do you keep and you have clearly opinions about these topics? How do you keep that balance in your writing? Like how do you keep it from infiltrating or or, you know, um, overriding, I guess, the artistic effort at hand? Like what are the sorts of things you think about when you're when you're writing? I just want to be sure that I'm not hitting people over the head with a message. So if I can show, for instance, in, mm -hmm. in Fire on the Island, um, uh, deal with the issue of homosexuality as the mm -hmm. cultural issue, which I do, which I do in the book. Uh, it's a matter of, okay, so what does that mean in terms of of gays in, in, in that society now, today, exactly today, or 20 years ago, or 100 years ago, because some of the, some of this stuff that I talk about, go, it goes way back. But how does, how does that evolve for, uh, you know, individuals? And that's just sort of what, I'm not trying to give a message, I'm trying to uh, show how certain situations really affect people in their personal lives and let, let the reader come away with what message is in that for them, if I can say it that way. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you write the uh, location as a character? No, I don't. Um, but, I mean, it's a, it, that's never been my intent. And I know people talk about location as a character, and I, I believe people read that into my work, and I believe it's there. Uh, I wish I had the quote in front of me, but it was some pretty noteworthy critic that said that I had a, a, a scene stealing book of that the scenes sort of really were so strong that they almost took over the story in a way. This was the fourth courier, uh, which was set in Poland mm -hmm. and, uh, in kind of a grim period of Poland's contemporary history. And, but no, that's not my intent. I want to know this. I want to know the, the setting very well. I, I, I use it. But I, it's not a character. Um, the mood of, I, I, I will say though that the mood of Warsaw in 1992, which is when my novel, The Fourth Courier, is set, that was pretty grim. Um, you know, coming off communism after 45 years of, of uh, occupation was pretty grim for the Poles. And, and that grimness comes across and it, it, it sort of, it's kind of a backdrop to everything, but it's not its own character. I wonder, you know, you, you've um, been to so many places and you've seen it from the inside. Um, do you think people in America really get the picture of some of these other countries? Or do you think that there's kind of a, a, a misinformation or there's just something that they don't really get? I don't think they get it at all. Uh -huh. I just don't think they get it at all. I, my, even my own family doesn't quite get what what it, what it's like. I I I I've, I've been traveling since I was a young man. I I uh, it was just part of something I chose to do. In fact, I can tell a funny story about that. But um, I had come back after a year or two or three months or six months of you know, traveling, and I'd ask a question. You know, I, I they'd ask a question like, "Was it fun? Did you have a nice time?" And then. They, they never never asked anything and uh i if you don't ask questions you don't get it you know, i wasn't just going to sit there and sort of talk about what it was like to be four months out of total lack of communication because i was traveling in asia before internet and email and this sort of stuff that you know in what was li what life was like for people the local people no i don't think i don't think americans get it much at all to be honest Sorry to say do, you that. do you think that um, that even if they do travel, sometimes they don't travel with an open mind? In other words, um, there's a lack of interest in, in knowing what you've your experience, but also do you think there's a way of traveling that is kind of closed off or for lack of a better word, touristy um, that's, you know, maybe lacking 
are missing the point. Well, sure, of course, because you, you look at these big cruise ships that are sometimes they have, have more people on them than my, my hometown have. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you know, yeah, I don't think they quite get it, you know. They're not gonna they're not gonna get it. So but I'm glad when people do travel because I think that's that's just so mind opening and educational, but um but you have to interact a little bit. And I don't know, I'm not gonna put down people who travel different ways. It's you know, we all have our own ways of doing it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the fire on the island, um kind of it, now so you call that a romantic thriller set in greece um and maybe uh give us a little bit of the the, the storyline here okay but well, first of all i did not call it a romantic thriller okay. I it a romantic thriller, and i actually thought it was a brilliant a brilliant choice um because you know it's very hard to write something and call it a literary thriller or a literary mystery or a smart mystery. It sounds like you're putting on airs and people don't quite know what that is, but, you know, I, but I don't write straight thrillers or mysteries. I, I, you know, and they're not cozy mysteries and they're not, what I write are not really thrillers in, in some ways. They're, they're much more, uh, more literary, but I thought romantic thrillers summed it all up because in, in this particular book, um, there are two or three different love affairs that are going on at the same time. There's a gay love affair or affair, I'll say not love necessarily. There's a straight love affair. Uh, you know, it's really, it's really a lot of fun. But the basic storyline is that there have been a series of fires. And this is all, this is all roughly based on truth, um, or fact. There have been a series of fires, uh, in a valley, each one moving closer to a particular village. And um, one of the main characters in the book has decided or believes that this arsonist is basically teasing the village and wants to burn down the village. And the best way to burn down the village would be to blow up the fuel tank, which is in the harbor for the, co for the Greek Coast Guard. And uh, that... Fear gets passed along to the right people that the American gay FBI agent posted to Athens uh, is sent down to see what's going on and try to stop this possibility of this Coast Guard station being put out of, out of service because it's in the process. It's very important in rescuing refugees that are coming in from Turkey. And all this takes place, actually, I'll say, in a village and on an island uh, where I have been going for the last 15 years and was very much involved in the refugee crisis. So a lot of, a lot of what's in the book, um, is really very, very real, very, very factual in how it's actually reported, even though it, it's all made to sound like fiction. But what really goes on is pretty much factual. So the FBI agent comes down and finds himself in a village that has conflicts that go back for literally a hundred years to an earlier refugee crisis when the Turks and the Greeks exchanged populations in 1923. Um, and that still, to this day, ripples through these villages. They still talk about it. And they, they have uh, family stories about that event and what it meant. Um, and so when I wanted to put together a novel that talked about um, kind of what contemporary Greek village life is like and during these multi crises that they're having. I took a national arsonist and <laughs> coming up and down a valley, starting fires. And I uh, went back to an historical uh, refugee crisis and uh, created this, uh, created this story um, that includes uh, s some real interesting stuff. It really has a charm of Zorba. Uh, it's how it's been described. Um, and it's uh, got a lot of very lovely characters in, them, in it. Uh, the characters. Now, Nick Domingos, um, the FBI agent, where do you get a main character like that? How do you get all the details worked out on, on who that character is going to be, how they're going to be, and how they're going to react to these situations? I mean, does that come from your own experience 
that you put into it, or is it people you've met, you know, a uh, combination of things? Uh, or, so maybe explain how you get Nick and how you get it to work. Okay, let me let me step back from that question with just a, a, a very uh, short response that in this book, uh, a lot of the characters are people I, I really do know, and that's that's true in most of my work, but it, particularly in Fire on the Island, and they recognize themselves, and I hope they don't sue me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but Nick, like all my main characters, um, are emotionally, they're me. And uh, I pad myself with things I've never been. I've never been a CIA agent or an FBI agent or uh, things like that. But Or I've never been, like in Cooper's Promise, a sharpshooter, gay deserter from the war in Iraq. I mean, all these characters that I have. But I think most writers really pull a lot from themselves. Um, and I have in... It, it, I have with Nick Domingos as well. I mean, uh, you know, I started going to Greece in 1972. My, my first job out of college was in Greece. And, you know, Nick's response to things, I make him a Greek American, but, you know, he's responding to things um, that he wouldn't have known as a Greek American in Fire on the Island, for instance. And it's sort of new to him. And I can remember those experiences are being. Uh, later, you know, sort of familiar with the whole thing, but always being a little bit surprised by things or just felt they were anew. So I can, I, I, I can relate to Nick, and I think I think that's where I find my main, my main characters. I think really come from me. I, but I will let me let me give a, uh, I guess as a metaphor, uh, at when I think of creating a character and what characters really are made up of, I think of. Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse, where his main character walks into the magic theater. And he sees himself in these mirrors, and these mirrors are like kaleidoscopes, and they each, they, every bit of them reflect a different part of his personality, of his character. And I, all my, as I write my novels, I think of that. I think of like taking pieces, I'm taking pieces from people here and here and here. The only thing different in my mind than in Herman Hesse's mind is that I actually have these mirrors shatter. I always thought they shattered. And uh, and he was, Harry, the main character, was pictured in shards on the floor and could pick them up and, you know, his different pieces of himself. But actually, they don't, they don't break. They're just, they're just the mirrors. I went back and reread it a couple of years ago just to think about it again. And um, but that's how I look at it. I, I, I see all of us is made up of these these different pieces, and you can pick them up and you can put them together and create these characters. And you know, as long as they make sense, you means they have to fit at least part of the crossword puzzle of each person, you know? <laughs> or not crossword puzzle, but jigsaw puzzle maybe. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. You know, I've talked to a lot of I, I, I write all true crime and uh, cults and all this. I, I, I do nonfiction. So um, all the fiction writers, it's very interesting to me um, to hear their, how they put it together. But quite a few of people this year have said that um, they have a, a how do they explain it? Their characters are actually like their kids or they're like, uh, um, family members or something so they always ha have them as as if they're like real people um do you have that kind of relationship or no i definitely think them as real people i i see them uh i i, I tend to write um in scenes as opposed to kind of longer drawn out uh narrative pieces um my my stuff moves very quickly and there's a couple of reasons for that. I think one is I've been trained as a screenwriter also and I enjoy that. I think that becomes apparent in my work. Uh, I grew up when television was never turned off. So I just had constantly scenes in my in my in my uh I'd walk through the living room, there'd be a scene on. You know, it's like I learned how to you know, that's that I really think has affected my writing. But yes, I 
I think of these characters as as uh, as real people. Um, I get very emotional about some of them, um, but I also think that that emotional part. I, I don't know, John, if you think this the same way, but I I, I see the the I see me in almost all the characters in some ways. There's little bits of me, you know. They, they, I can relate to all of them, and I feel they can relate to me even though they're totally different. I mean, I've got, you know, from circus characters to secretaries, what do you want to say? I don't know what to say, but, you know, but I think emotionally I relate to all my characters. Yeah. I mean, I think that's absolutely true. I, I, I don't, it's interesting when people do spot characters because, you know, we're all kind of stealing from things we see around us. The reality is, and my answer always is, they're all me. <laughs> right. They're all pieces of me. They may be perceptions I have of other people, but they're really, they're really still just my perceptions and pieces of me and reasons why I might perceive that in someone else. They're really just pieces of, of me. Um, and so, you know, I always like to think of like all writing is kind of like, you know, all fiction writing is kind of like autobiography because you're always writing yourself into these things, but you're just kind of concealing it in fiction better. <laughs> yeah. Good. I'm glad you said that. It, 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 it makes you feel like I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're fine. <laughs> I, well, I think so. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I, okay, so w when is it that you feel the confidence enough to actually put the book out? So, you know, when do you think it's ready? And, and uh, quite often writers have a go back and redo attitude, uh, which can last a really long time. Um, I don't know if it's lack of confidence or if it's just, uh, you know, it can be a lot of things. Is that an issue for you? I. I think the time, time is the best editor. And so it's, it's a worthwhile thing for authors, writers to put things aside for a while if they can bear doing it and coming back to it. Um, but I think that the publishing industry also forces that time on us, that it's a very difficult industry to break into. And, um, so you, you have a lot more time than you really want on almost anything. But I think it's better to put something aside and go back to it. And, you know, I've put aside the fourth courier, which is not, which is on my last book, but the one before it, I, that was set aside for a few years. And I just went on to some screenwriting and other work. And then I, so, you know, I, I always thought there was something good in that book. And I went back to it. And I thought, oh my God, this is really good stuff. And I caught an error that I, really think would interest people. So I, so I put that out, but um, I, I, I work very hard when I'm writing. I, I don't make a lot of progress on a daily basis. When I finally get through the first draft, it's not like, Oh my God, I've got another year of work on this. I, I usually have, another, you know, two years of work on it, but <laughs> I think I only have six months. Um, but one of the things that I do is I write a screenplay adaptation for my novels because that is an incredible editing tool. Uh, it's, it focuses you on the dramatic through story, whereas novels allow you to get squishy at the edges and kind of give a little bit more backstory than you might be able to tell on a, on a screenplay. But you're really focused on a screenplay through the dramatic through story and how to tell that. Um, in as few words as possible. And you, you're really focused on the dialogue. And, and I find that going back with a screenplay perspective, that the dialogue really pops even more. Um, my problem is, is that I, I sometimes want to reduce things too much. And a novel allows me to be a little bit more florid or uh, open or discursive or something, whatever you want to say, just, you know, I can use longer sentences and I'm not limited to 120 pages. But but the screenplay is, an, is a really final editing tool for me. I think it really sharpens my work. Yeah, I guess in a way it could make it, um, it makes it more realistic, right? When you do a screenplay, when people are actually working the 
the, the book you're writing. Yes. Uh, and I, and I think that yeah, I've never seen one of my screenplays produced, unfortunately, <laughs> but when I have seen a play produced, it's interesting to, it's always been wonderful to see it, um, interpreted by different uh, act actors and actresses. Just really, uh, it's exciting because, you know, what you put on the page, somebody else is going to read very differently. That's what I've discovered. So, and that's, I think, part of the fun of it. What do you think of the publishing world now with all the self-publishing and Amazon and just all the small publishers and everything going on? Um, do you think it's better or worse? Um. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Controversy. It, that, it's, it's, that's a, controversy, a little controversial and, and a very complicated question. I'll try to answer it very quickly if I can. I'd written a couple of novels and, and uh, had kept getting rejections, and, but, but, but being told it's a great story and great writing, and, and, uh, and, and I'd put them in screenplays. I was winning contests, grand prizes here and there, and literally, you know, all that. So when I couldn't get a publisher interested in the work, um, I self-published a novel, my first novel, which was Cooper's Promise. But that's the novel I chose to self-publish, the second novel I wrote. And I did it very strategically because the problem with self-publishing, in my mind, to this day, uh, is that there are no gatekeepers. So nobody's saying this is a good book and this is a bad book. And Amazon is actually the worst at that because they let you throw anything up. They don't care. So I, I decided to go to a self-publisher that required editing and also had a a, a relationship with Barnes & Noble that the top one – that the top 1% of the books they self-published, that they consider were the best top 1% of the books Barnes & Noble would put on their shelves. And I said, I'll go with that. And, and, that, and I did that. And I chose, of the two books that I had, I had a book about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with a gay character. And I had a book called Cooper's Promise, in which it was told entirely from one character's perspective, and he was gay. And I thought... I'm going to go with that because if if the gay community gives me a pass, a good good reviews and gives me a pass on this, I can go somewhere. And it, and I thought, well, and they will because it is a good book. It's not just erotica or it's not whatever gay work was like at that time. It was a real story with an action hero that was extremely sympathetic. And I so I went with that and that did exactly what I wanted to do. It, it got me the notice of a small publisher, a re very respectful small publisher out of Colorado who published uh, a Vision of Angels, republished Cooper's Promise as, as his publication, not my self-published book. And then that got me noticed by what is the leading literary agency in New York and the most uh, uh, fastest growing independent publisher in America. So... Self-publishing did that for me, but it was a very strategic approach and choice that I made of which novel I chose and who I marketed it to to get the right response. Do you think it's still um, it's still a struggle for a gay writer to be published by a major publishing house? I can't answer that exactly because uh, I don't think that my publisher – thought of me as a gay writer when when um, they picked me up, nor did my agent. I mean, they knew I was, but I was the one that said, let's go after the gay market. I think that there's a big market for the, these works. And um, and I don't think that that is, is as exclusionary as it used to be. And no, I don't think there's any problem being a gay writer these days. John might have a different feeling about this, but I think that um, things have opened up considerably um, in, in, the, in the diversity world. Um, you know, it's, uh, I just feel that what I see online and what's being published and what's out there, I don't know if it's getting, these things are getting major publications or major publishers or whatever, but uh, I feel that the, it's opened up tremendously very, very recently in, in a lot of ways. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to uh, agree that it's um, gotten a lot better. Um, I, I do think that if you're writing something that a publisher sees as um, appealing to a broader audience, that's not purely, uh, you know, an LGBTQ audience yeah. or a gay audience, then you're going to be more likely to be picked up. I think if your audience seems more exclusively you know, inside the community, then I think you're going to struggle and maybe a self-publishing route might be better. Um, I think, but I do think there are problems. I don't think it's perfect at all. I don't think it's solved, but it's, yeah. um, it's better. <laughs> that's my point of view. Yeah, no, no. I, I, and that's, I'm, I'm basically saying the same thing. It, it's just better. Yeah. And, you yeah. know. Hmm. What would you say to a person that's writing that hasn't published anything that wants to? What would you? What would advice would you give to someone entering this publishing world now? <laughs> Go to college and get a, get yeah. a music <laughs> Well, I know, but you know, I, I will say, uh, you know, about the editing and about improving your writing and moving forward, it's very important. Uh, I think that's kind of the thing that comes out of Amazon that's not so good is because anybody could do anything and you're right there's no gatekeeper they, they spell things incorrectly they uh, it's just a terrible piece of work more because of the um, you know the grammar and the, the the technical stuff than maybe the story but that's what's being missed in a lot of the self-publishing I think so um, my advice would be to like say for instance is to get a really good editor get someone that's can be a good proofreader that will give you the truth you know well yeah uh, proofreaders aren't going to give you the truth they're going to tell you where, where you need a comma um, but uh, editors I, I'm, not, I'm not sure really what, what the question is Alan. Well, what would you say to a, um, oh, a new a, a person that hasn't published anything, that's sitting at home and and they they write a lot, but they're not sure what to do? How what kind of advice would you say to someone that is in that place? Well, I, I'd say just uh, you know, there are lots of opportunities out there uh, for getting things. Publish. You want to build your resume the best you can, and so you want to get into flash fiction contests. You want to, uh, if you happen to write short stories, I don't, but a lot of people do, and they're very competitive. The short stories contests, I think, but um, do that. There's lots of screenplay contests. You want to enter these things where you're going to get, you can get a, a resume built. That's the pro. That's the thing. You, you've got to, unless you unless you just have the right magic and the perfect novel and you just the right uncle who happens to be head of some publishing house or something you know it's not it's you know it's just hard work it's just a slog and the competition is more than it's ever been because when you think about it when i started writing novels and i had to put a 300 page manuscript into a box and send it off for 25 or 30 or 35 dollars i mean that was really an investment. I mean, I, you know, now you just basically do a PDF and punch a button. It costs you nothing. So, you know, the, the, the competition of people who think they can write and, and are just out there just flooding things, it's, it's huge. And you've just got to, you just got to work to be better and, and, uh, and just know it's a lot of hard work to get recognized is a lot of hard work. Yeah, you can't just box up your manuscript and send it with the horse and buggy. No. <laughs> oh, um, so so where do you see yourself going with this? Are you just gonna? Are you just a writer now for life? Yeah, I'm a writer for life. But let me just go back to one one thing I want to say about the previous question, which is, you don't have to write a novel or a screenplay and get it produced or published to have somebody get interested in you as an agent, for instance, because I was nominated. Pushcart is real, is really, push, the Pushcart Prize, everybody knows. Pushcart is a little bit strange. I was nominated for a 2018 prize 
for something that was published in 2016, which was a thousand words long. And then I got my, my agent in 2017, who told me that the most, the most interesting thing on my resume was that I had been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. So you don't have to be writing huge, big novels and selling those from the start. If you can find the right ways to get smaller things published and build a little bit of a, of a track record that way, I think that's very important. Um, and, 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 and that's a lot easier than, than getting a publisher for a 300 page novel. Uh, uh, what's going on with me now? What's coming up with me, Alan? Um, I see myself really uh, continuing with novels. I have played in the, around the past with stage plays and screen plays, but I think the novel is really the form that I finally enjoy the most and have several lined up. I, I'm halfway uh, through, I, I believe I'm halfway through, uh, a new novel uh, it takes place in Istanbul. Uh, it's a story of a young gay Syrian, Syrian refugee who's ended up in Istanbul under really tragic circumstances and he's tr struggling to survive. And his only goal in life is to be safe. And he is confronted in the same 24 hours by both CIA and ISIS to do something that's extremely unsafe for him. So it's a really a look into the kind of soul and thinking of a, of a, of a refugee uh, and, uh, and a very suspenseful novel at the same time, which I'm very excited about. Well, you know, so so do these things like with the world, like in 2020, like all the nutty stuff going on and, you know, the conspiracies and, you know, and the dumb orange one and you've got the COVID and you've got there's just all of this stuff happening last year. It was pretty intense. Um, does that seep into your writing? Do you find that it affects the way you write? Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't. I pretty much on the, kind of do the same thing under lockdown and confinement that I I did uh, without it uh, in terms of writing, in terms of my daily schedule and what I do. The only thing I'm really lacking in in a real different uh, scheduling sense is, is lack of exercise. I'm, I'm a swimmer, and so I can't swim in the sea in the winter, and there are no pools open. So that's that, the that's biggest thing for me. But... Um, yeah, but the stress uh, yeah. itself, you know, the stress of what's going on outside of your house. Uh, like a lot of us writers, I, I'm not so far off now that being at home um, as I used to be, because that's kind of what we do anyway. But but the stress going on outside of your door and you knowing that it's going on outside, does that in itself put you in a different mood to write? It makes me take naps. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Well, that's you know, that's the effect. It's not a bad response. <laughs> yeah. Me... Uh, go ahead, Alan. I'm I was going to say, it just makes me not watch TV. But I think yeah. I think that. Um, well, you see, because I, I get a lot of interesting responses from that. Some people that, uh, it, you know, their writing becomes much darker, or they're, they're, it's a little bit more negative. Then you have people that totally know it gets more fantastical, you know, they get more uh, fantasy involved. And then you've got people like myself that it really sort of, it can shut me down for a couple of weeks at a time because I'm, I don't know, I just can't get into it so I, I just find that because you you go around and you are in very interesting situations and in countries where there is a lot of turmoil anyway going on and what you're writing about is involved in some sort of turmoil and so I was just wondering if this has changed or it does it get into your writing I'm just going to be honest and say no I, I don't think it has I I, I will say that uh, I'm getting a little bit tired of the lockdown. I've been a total of two restaurants in 11 months. Um, but, uh, but in terms of my writing, no, I, I my writing hasn't gotten darker. My writing isn't particularly dark. The darkest book was the Polish book, and that's just was the setting, the time, and the and the season. But uh, no, I um, 
It has it hasn't affected me that much. I, I I will say there there are times. I mean, I'll be honest, you know I think oh, I just I just don't have another word. I'm just like I'm kind of worn out by what's going on around me. I go out in the streets and people aren't wearing masks. I get aggravated and that. But my writing hasn't really been affected by it. I you know a few mood mood swings, but the writing isn't. I'm not going there with. I don't want to write about this. I don't want to write about the pandemic. In fact, I, I will tell you, I'll break in to your question with, with a different kind of answer, which is the next book I thought I was going to write, uh, not the Syrian book in Istanbul, was going to be my what I would call my American novel. Um, I, I have a long history in America. I'm 14th generation American. And um, I grew up in a very interesting town. And I, and I have a very, very interesting story I want to write set there, but it would it would have meant when I decide when I was thinking about this novel of taking on America at the start of the Trump era, and and it would have meant taking on my family through the context of that. And I decided I'm not going to do that. So the whole sort of situation of the last two or three years uh, now, including the pandemic, has just made me want to shy away from taking on that American story. But I uh, will probably be ready to do that in about a year. I just didn't want to, I, I just, I felt that if I did it when I was thinking about first doing it, it was going to take me to such a dark place. I didn't personally want to go there. Yeah, certainly. And, and, and there's, there was a lot of uncertainty uh, in the air uh, over the past and I, I, there still is in a way. Yeah. And right. so I think that's sort of something that uh, it's hard to, to kind of like, finalize it you don't know where it's going to go still and uh, what's going to happen and i think that's the question like you can wa- write about things from world war ii or world war one and and different things that have sort of already passed but uh the last few years i don't i don't know if we're really going to see any clearing for another few few years to go still actually i'm very optimistic about the situation i won't go into the politics but I, i'm very optimistic that the American system has <laughs> managed to survive. So, oh, the system itself will, but it just mat- But how much damage does it cost to the people in the system? Well, I don't worry about some of the people in the system who are like attacking the Capitol building. But uh, I've always been an advocate for the low-income people and the Native Americans. I did a lot of work with them and things like that. And so, you know, those are the people I, I particularly worry about. I, I think that, but I think that those who are not marginalized. Um, Great Lane system will will recover okay because I think the system is going to recover okay, and I think we are going to move into a much more uh, humanitarian situation in the country, uh, more caring for people because we've just got a whole other generation coming up who think differently than than yep. what, what we did before. So I, I'm very hopeful, honestly. Um, well, good. And if it doesn't work out, we'll we'll look for you. <laughs> <laughs> then you can read my dystopian book. <laughs> It'll be it's all your fault. Yeah. <laughs> right. I tell you. Uh, well, no, I've been I've been up in Canada since uh, last year in March and recording from up here, and uh, it's been quite a bit more peaceful, and it's certainly a different feeling um, than what what goes on in the States right now. So, um, yeah, you know, hopefully everything goes in the, the right direction. Well, but. I, I do agree about the younger generation because I'm a, I'm a teacher by trade. And I think um, I spend a lot of time with young people um, and the way they think is, um, is really very different than, you know, the way we've seen things go recently. So I just think it takes time. So I'm hopeful too. But I think patience has got to be part of that hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, John, for saying that because I, I really, I really do believe that we're. I don't know how old you are, but I, we're. I'm the old guard, and you know, they're done with us. That's fine, you know, because <laughs> this earth needs some new thought thinking. It needs some help, and there's no way that the, that, um. The old ways are going to are going to solve the problems. There have to be some serious new revolutionary things going on to really yeah. 
well, she we can was, hope. But, you know, the hippies in the 60s, we peace and love, we thought, was going in the right direction. And um, <laughs> I don't know. We ended up with, with what we ended up with the last few years. So I don't, I, I'm, I'm hopefully cautious. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh, so listen, um, how do people find you? If someone wants to stalk you or, or um, find out where your books are, where, where, do, where do they go? Um, well, they're wherever books are sold, seriously. They're, you know, they're easily online with like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Bookshop. Uh, but my books are distributed um, through Simon & Schuster. And so they're available at any, any independent bookstore can order it and have it in a couple of days. Do you have a website or um, something as well? Oh, yeah, I have a website, sure. Uh, it's uh, www.myname, in full, Timothy J. Smith, that's J-A-Y, so Timothy J. Y. Smith, dot com. Fantastic. Well, it's been a pleasure. Uh, education here. Same here. Uh, We've had uh, we've, we've had the writer of several books. His last one was Fire on the Island, a romantic thriller, according to the publisher. Uh, the author, Timothy J. Smith. Now, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Thanks, John. Are you prepared? Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. Go now to LegacyFoodStorage.com. Use coupon code HOM15 now for 15% off. Quick, go. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.